art director at Triggerfish, as well as the series art director over the whole anthology of Kisazimoto Generation Fire. This has been a long journey, but a very rewarding one. I was lucky enough to be the little fairy, sometimes devil, peering over the shoulders of all the directors with absolute awe. And so it's really nice to have you here to get stuck into conversation about what went into the art of Enkai and how you ended up, we ended up with this absolutely beautiful award-winning film. My name is Dorian. Um, I was assistant director and CG lead on Enkai, um, and I really enjoyed working with all the Blink team and, of course, Niendo. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here with you guys and talk about Enkai again. It's great. Hi, I'm Niendo. Okay, I'm the writer-director of Enkai. Um, and uh, same as Dorian, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to share this space with everyone and to share the journey that we went on from beginning to where we are now. I'm Rita Week, and I was lucky enough to work on some of the early concept art um, for Enkai. Uh, um, definitely one of the, you know, you get those briefs that come in every now and then that are just the best briefs in the world. So as soon as you've got a, a brief um, where... Uh, someone is requesting creatures that are going to be made up of all sorts of bits and pieces like um that was just absolutely exciting and got us on board straight away hello i'm carmen zirfogel and i worked on the early concept art of the backgrounds for Enkai, which was really beautiful i'm emma i'm the production manager um, on Enkai, and it was an absolute privilege to support such a talented team i'm camille i was the art director on Enkai. Uh, so I worked from your work, Carmen and Sherry, but it's nice to meet you. Uh, and lead background artist, glad to be here as well. My name is Klaas. I was a 3D animation supervisor on Enkai. And it was, um, yeah, it was really like a, a beautiful experience to, to be part of this project. Let's start with the icebreaker. Um, as a fun start, I'm going to ask... If each of you could bring one visual element or piece of artwork from Enkai into the real world, what would it be and why? Anything from a character design, a specific scene's background, an item, prop used within an episode. Um, I personally would like to steal Shiro's headdress, but it would be really nice to hear what you guys connected with. Uh, yeah, the headdress is a good one. Um... I think me, I would bring the door to Tayari that Enkai is creating because wow. it would be amazing to be able to, you know, escape to like a better, more beautiful world every now and then, you know. So, yeah, I wow. would love, love to have it in my living room, you know. And it's a lovely design piece as well. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, Awa is based on my cat, Chairman. Um, and I got the little maquette um, at, that was uh, created for the CGI uh, references that we we did. Um, and I did introduce Chairman to Awa and it, it just felt like there was a little bit of a competition going on. So I'd really like to have Awa as a real creature and like let them have their adventures together and see what happens, so. I would definitely see that film. <laughs> Um, I think I would bring uh, some of the plants that we made for the stop motion set for Theari at the end. There were some really beautiful ones that really glowed under fluorescent lights and had these little LEDs on the ends of them. I think they'd make beautiful little, little lamps and just really brighten up the world a bit. 
I thought about it too. I was a bit greedy. I just put Thayari as a whole. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I guess anything coming from Thayari, the plants, the creatures are pretty cool. So I think everything stop motion feels very you know, three dimensional. You kind of want to have it, and it's it's super playful as well. I would just go for uh, the two main characters' eyelashes because they're just fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely go for the beetle with the good half good body um because i think it would be an awesome alarm clock in the morning to just be woken up by this nice little shake and also a nice doorbell you know i think very nice uh, nice little creature to let you know when you've got visitors um in a nice calm manner winning the prestigious annie award for best limited series is a significant achievement highlights the exceptional quality of art and animation in kizazimoto generation fire so with this in mind what aspects of the artwork and visual storytelling in enkai do you believe contributed to the success what makes enkai stand apart and push it into the realm of an award-winning short uh, what gives it its star quality I think it's this uh, mixed media approach that we had. Uh, I've been like experimenting with mixed media over for over a decade and each film that I've been uh, producing, I've been testing out different um, ways of combining media based on like depending on what the story was. So I think I've just been curating this this sort of taste over time. But I did intern, I interned with Blink in 2012. And, you know, I got to be on sets for different directors and see how they were working. And they, Blink has a very specific, like very mixed media approach to uh, their creativity. So over the years I've been watching Blink and I knew when this opportunity came up, I thought this is, this is the chance to like just mix media to the, to the max. We are doing all the mixed media possible. And Caroline, I, I know I bring this up, but I can remember our conversation where I was like, oh, I think Harry should be stop motion. And you were like, I don't I don't know about that, Nando. I think you might be going too far. And I was like, but it's made with, and Kai's making things with her hands in her bedroom. And I can remember being a kid and like playing with stuff, like even glue, I can still smell the glue, um, uh, the textures of different things that we were playing with as children. And I was like, of course, it has to be, you know, it has to be made. It has to be stop motion. So working with Blink on this specific opportunity, being able to uh, bring really talented people from the very beginning uh, throughout the project. I'm really happy that, uh, you know, people who are working at, at Blink are here, like Emma, Dorian, Camille, uh, class, because all of everyone who is here was so talented and was so dedicated to the project. So beyond like the vision that was initially there, the mixing of these different talents and the vision of each of the people who was on the project meant that the project became even more than we could have imagined. Yeah, I think for me, I totally agree with the mixed media aspect of it. I think it's fresh. It's not new, but it's it's done in a very fresh way because um, we've been really in intentional about it. You know, like one, one world is one style. So I think it played a lot. But also um, for me, it's also showing a culture that the mainstream media is not used to, to see or doesn't know about. Um, and I think it's that's why the world anthology is a success. It's because, yeah, we, we don't know about those cultures. And for once, we, we see what it is. We see how beautiful and how rich all these cultures are. And mixed with, like, futuristic aspect, it was even more beautiful. So, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the incorporation of cultural artifacts and symbols, because I know it was such an important part of this reunion. That it was um, really something that you continually expressed you know, your desire for it to be represented properly. And it would be nice to know, you know, from the early stage briefing, how the team did research and incorporated those cultural artifacts and symbols. Um, this was a deep conversation, I remember, between you and the team with loads of references and research. Um, so it would be great if you could tell us a bit about the process of ensuring, because this word did come up, respectful and accurate representation. You know, I was looking at mythologies that uh, we have in our culture, stories that, you know, I heard as I was growing up. And I was trying to think about how we could um, reinterpret these stories and, and bring them into this uh, futuristic space. 
that we are exploring. One of, you know, as soon as I decided that Shiro was our god um, and Shiro being a, a female human being, her being a woman meant that I'm already taking my culture and sort of turning um, uh, the ideas of who we believe God is on, on its head. And I feel that this also allowed us like a, a lot of uh, liberty to be able to experiment with different aspects based on our mythology, but not being tied down to tradition in a way that um, wouldn't allow us any flexibility. So it was a mix of doing that, researching, making sure that things were very grounded and also uh, building a space in which we could uh, tell a, an entirely new story. Within our culture, being able to have uh, like keystones that don't shift and then being able to shift other ones and reinterpret them. Incorporate that question into a few more questions, you know, into the environments and into the character design. Let me just uh, jump right into character design. Salim, unfortunately, couldn't join us today. He was the initial character designer that um, we had on board. Niendo, you started working with, working with him quite early on. Um, and it's, he's wonderful to work with. It was a privilege to work with him. And so nice to see that his contribution carried throughout the film, you know, the character that we love and, um, you know, that journey that that character went on to come out as beautiful as it did, but still maintain some of its essence. Uh, so anyway, Salim, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the question that I'd like to pose to you is, the characters in Enkai are not only exceptionally beautiful, iridescent, but also carry a deep cultural significance. Can you discuss the character design process, the brief and how traditional African motives and contemporary influences were blended to create these characters? Yeah, there's a lot of um, influences. There's obviously some uh, influences from the actual places. You know, we've been looking at uh, Mount Kenya, the, you know, the Red Earth, well, first we have three different kind of environments and we wanted to really differentiate each one of them. So we have their house, which is based on the gold, which is the cultural reference. We have, well, it's kind of yeah, a version of Kenya in a hundred years time. One of the artistic challenge for us, I think, was really to differentiate each one of those worlds and to have a very clear aesthetic for each one of them, which I think also answers the first question about, you know, what makes it stand out is it's the mixed media, but it's also that each of those media is attached to a, a different aesthetic, a different mood. So for instance, the, their house is quite, well, I should, even in their house, there are two, two moods. There is like Enka's room, which is more childish and warm, and she's, you know, it's playful. And you have Shiro, who is a bit colder and wiser, so it's more blue. She's very, she's only thinking about Earth. So again, blue, blue is her magic. Then you have Earth, which is very red because destruction and because of that red Earth. Uh, and then you have Thayare, which is basically the dream of a little girl creating her own world. Uh, and it's super, yeah, three-dimensional and physical and uh, and super playful again. And so, yeah, one of the challenges, I think for me, one of the biggest challenge was to differentiate each one of those worlds. And I would say especially the CG world and the 2D world, so their house from the outside world, because we wanted their house to be CG, but a stylized CG, not a realistic one, both, I would say, for appeal, like we wanted it to look like that. It, it was the kind of aesthetic that we liked. And to be honest, resources, because I don't think we had the resources to make a super realistic CG look. Uh, but that meant that the 2D world, which was Earth, had to look more 2D, than the 2D stylized CG we were doing in their house, basically. Uh, and so to do that, we had to play on a lot of different small things. So for instance, uh, something I suggested was not to use too much comp uh, compositing on Earth, so no depth of field, no lens flare, none of that kind of thing. Just keep everything quite flat, not to have any, because you could paint something in a realistic way and have bounce slides, etc. I thought it would be better to have something a bit more flat, to have what I call fake outline, which is, it's not really outlining anything, but it's creating the illusion of an outline to uh, with a shadow maybe or highlight, just to make it look a little bit more graphic and less realistic. Um, I, I would do, I would love to hear uh, from Re a little bit about when you were creating the creatures in the beginning, some of the influences that Niendo shared with you and that discussion around that, what was important 
um, in that design, in, in that design process with those little characters that lived in Tiari. What was great um, working with Niendo is how, you know, we really, we spoke a lot and um, Niendo supplied really great references. Um, and funny enough, I was, I actually went to Nairobi for the first time a few months ago. So it, like, it was so great seeing the, the buses and the shop fronts. And yeah, it was really nice to see that it really, really captured perfectly and came across so well. Um, in terms of the characters, um, the character design for Thayari, if if I was a kid and I was trying to create creatures, what materials would you be using? Uh, what would those creatures be? What would you want them to do? And it was just, it was really, really delightful being able to work on something that you really going back into your childhood. And um, like Neander was mentioning a little bit earlier, being able to smell that glue on your hand. That was such a, a delightful part of the process. Definitely, I really wanted to uh, make sure that the film was grounded in in a lot of traditional references and then also modern day references. So, Re, for you to say that you went to Nairobi and you felt as if you were in the film because of uh, the way that we've captured uh, the essence of what it is to be within Kenya. Um, and then also from all the references that I shared with you, like that for me feels very satisfying because that means that we 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 you know we got the essence of Kenya and, and delivered it within the film. For uh, Enkai, the initial images that I sent and shared with uh, Salim were based on um, images captured during initiation um, uh, ceremonies in Kikuyu culture and the specific clothing that young girls would wear uh, uh, during this period. And I because Enkai is going through a coming of age story, I felt that I wanted to have this specific clothing for this specific moment in life used uh, like that she would wear them within Shiro's uh clothing there's there's lots of like small symbolism that is also included you know we we used to wear these like a uh, brown uh fabrics uh sometimes it was leather that was that was dyed in my ethnic group in Kikuyu culture where we have nine clans the the nine original daughters is where uh, uh we all come from so even that these are little like hieroglyphic on her on her dress that symbolizes that and then the makanga is our interpretation of of the makanga people who get everyone onto the bus in Nairobi and like the grit and and, and like power that they carry um so each character was designed really specifically thinking about who they were as a person and what journey they're going to go through. So even Awa, Awa starts off with tiny little wings on his back. And at the end, because Enkai has finally uh, graduated, has finally achieved this new level of being a, a god, um, it grants him uh, these beautiful wings that open up in the ending scene. So everyone's uh, design is thinking about who they are and how they transition. Also really spent a lot of time making sure not only the clothing, but also the facial features, you mm. know, like the, the body type. It was really important to you, Niendo, that we got it right, you know, like how is Shiro, like like our body proportion, same for Enkai, and you really wanted the facial feature like the lips, you know, like, like the shape of the eyes, you were, you really wanted us to get it right, you know, so I think it was really important for, to, to, to get the representation right, you know, to do something a bit different than usual, than just, you know, giving them a black skin and that's it you know we we had to go um, a lot into details very interesting to see this across the anthology and all the different um detail features stand out and also you know to that person's obviously geographical location and it is so varied and so important for viewers around the world to, to see themselves in that format the settings and backgrounds in Enkai um, contribute significantly to its immersive uh, nature. How did the team, you, approach the creation of the environments and what did you take your visual cues from? What was your discussion with Niendo and what references had she given you and what were you really trying to achieve when you created Tayari and their room, uh, their nest that they lived in? Weirdly enough, I actually used a nest as the initial um, reference because I was really into all the weaving and especially those willow, like a lot of these um, architectural willow branches. I was really keen on that. But in the end, the gourd really worked well, um, the holes in the gourd. So, um, yeah, the, the gourd, their rooms, um, 
were were quite simple. I mean, they were quite decorative with with all of Enkai's um, toys and potions and tools. But uh, my fun really came in with Enkai's world um, theory. It was just so much fun. Those colors I loved so much, and um, we didn't. Re well, I didn't really use um, specific locations except for Mount Kenya. It was I, I tried to use very uh, otherworldly references that Nino recommended. Um, so a lot of seed pods and um, very unusual plants that are African, but also a few that were maybe Asian and just, you know, looked really unusual. So it didn't stick to one thing. So it was quite varied, like baobab trees and, you know, really unusual fungi and corals and things. And that also dictated the colors a bit. When we were building the galaxy in space, we actually managed to use some shots from NASA, some really high res deep space <laughs> images to, to build the galaxy, which felt really, really special to get in there. So there's the, the reference shoots that you did remotely with actors in Nairobi. Um, there's extraordinary attention to detail, um, animating the movement of Shira and Nkai, and then hearing about this. In what ways do you think that elevated the episode's storyline? Or just tell us a little bit more about it. It sounds fascinating. Well, I think it was really important to Nyendo to 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 find actors who could portray Shiro and Enkai, uh, and for us to use them. And so that's what we did. We had a we had a reference shoot um, out in Kenya with some really beautiful women. Um, and I think also Nyendo obviously shot some of her own reference as well, which I'm sure she hopes never gets seen by anyone. <laughs> I know that was quite difficult for you to do, but I think given that. Uh, some of our animation team, especially were male, I think that was quite useful for them to really see how women move in particular, you know, a lot of the physical actions that Shiro does. Um, but I think the biggest thing that was useful um, from my point of view was having a younger actress play Enkai. I think there were so many childish, joyful movements and expressions that she just did, even between takes that that we really pulled from to give Enkai that really kind of youthful um, character. I think for me, um, we, we used to do these one-on-ones every week and we would discuss a lot um, about what was going well and what was not going well. And and I feel like there was like, a there's, I think I've never worked on a project that was, which was so much in a way vulnerability um, and, and also trying, like you said, Emma, like it was really helpful for the, the the animators to to see how how women would move let's say and and find still find like technical ways as well to do it so that process for me was very challenging but also really um beautiful to witness let's say earlier you you asked like what is it that made this film win the any or any or the any and why is it so special and i think it's it's sort of like a very it's a very honest film and it's and it's not trying to hide anything and it's very um it's showing a lot of i feel like the the, the performances that you gave through your acting uh, and you know also seep through into the movie as they were animated and, and i think that's for me one of the reasons why it's getting so much attention let's say and so good <laughs> So true to try to remove your perception of something is so difficult in art and then start like a child, like a, you know, from new, seeing it with your eyes rather than your mind um, can be very challenging. I'd like to direct the next one to Blink um, because it's such a fascinating part of the film and, and what you've created. So you used uh, 3D stop motion and 2D animation in the making of Inkai. I'm really interested to know how these techniques enhance the storytelling and visual impact of the episode. Tell us a little bit about the significance of using each visual approach to transition between the worlds. Well, I mean, it was mentioned before, but uh, Nyendo, you mentioned it, but the fact that um, for stop motion, it relates to Enkai's magic. She's building those stuff. She's a kid. And so I think that's that's why you wanted to use stop motion. I also think that stop motion is great at making things look three-dimensional, but not CG, because obviously it is three-dimensional. It is not CG, but it looks... I think it's also great for the reveal of the end. It's like that's 
the most epic moment of the film for me, you know, after, you know, like you have all the, the eruption on Earth, uh, all of that. But that, for me, the epic moment of the film is the reveal of Thayari and especially the reveal of uh, when, when she brings life to Thayari, stop motion animation in that moment. I think it's the best thing we could have done to, to, to literally say, okay, this came to life. And that's, you know, animation coming to life. The use of three different techniques, it's very yeah, related to defining uh, an aesthetic for each one of the world. So it's like, it's related to their magic. Basically, that's the whole thinking behind it is Shiro's magic is she's created Earth with it. And so it relates to that 2D look and Enkai's magic. She's created Tayari with it and Awa. And that's also why Awa, even though technically he, Awa is CG, he's done in CG. We try to make it look different from the rest of the of the CG in the film. It's supposed to look stop motion. I think it's, it does. Uh, but yeah, that's I think that's the thinking behind the three different techniques and what they bring to the film. It's definitely something that is for me quite new and was really successful. Um, I would like to ask this question of Niendo. Um, future artistic endeavors. Are there any particular styles, or themes, or techniques? after Enkai that you're eager to explore and um, how has Enkai inspired your artistic journey? Yeah I mentioned earlier that uh, I've been playing with mixed media for um, a about a decade since uh, I, I graduated at uh, the Royal College of Art so uh, I feel that this is such a culmination of all the experimentation that I've been doing and then Kai really allows me to imagine something uh, further than this. And, and just to add to what uh, Camille was saying, um, you know, the the three worlds are divided by the, you know, who who they're representing. So the CGI world, because the story is focused on Shiro and Enkai's journey, uh, their space is CGI. It's the fullest, uh, most like defined space um, because they are gods within the story and it's their story. When we come to Earth, we are products um, made by uh, Shiro and we have a flatter existence. And that's why I wanted Earth to be 2D. I also wanted us to feel like the precariousness of the way the people are living uh, in the lower level, especially. So I wanted to really have these like sense of flat shapes that are just put together to make their homes um, and, and how unstable their lives are. The diary um, as stop motion uh, we mentioned is because of Enkai creating things with her hands and us wanting to capture that, that sense of uh, her childhood. So as I go forward, I think this has just shown me what is possible to achieve when you, like, you're working with uh, like people who have such creativity and such talent. Um, and it's not going to be that I envision and, and that's what's going to happen. It's going to be a collaboration. And also for this, I think, Emma, you had something uh, to add if you just uh, want to hop on. I was just going to say, I think, um, especially with having Enkai, uh, her world at the end, the up they are in stop motion um, versus the CG and the 2D worlds that we created. I think that really um, emphasizes Enkai's uniqueness and shows the audience that you don't have to follow exactly your parents or your society or your culture, that you can celebrate it and interpret it and create a world around you as you kind of see it. And I think that's really beautiful. Can I just add, I was sitting next to Taylor uh, the first time that we, as the directors, we were in LA. It was the first time we were watching each other's films. Uh, and Taylor is someone who just has like he carries a lot of expression in in his he can't hide it anything that he feels it's like so I was sitting next to him when we were watching Ankai, and he, you know he's like whoa this is beautiful this is in in their home then we get to Earth and he's like wow this is fantastic and then it's kind of plateaued and then the doors open for for Diary and the pineapples are like spinning and he was he almost fell off his chair yeah and I was like yes. We did it. This is exactly what we wanted. We wanted you to get to the end of the film and like you think you've seen everything. You think you're satiated and then you discover you know nothing. And that is the, the power of the stop motion. Beautiful. Like the way it just finishes, just devours you. It's, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say quickly that um, this project was a really unique experience. I mean, it was great to work with Union, though. I mean, with you, Emma, and Camille, and Klaas, you know it. I feel like the whole team came together and made the effort to to make this project properly the way you wanted to do it, Nendo, and you know what I'm talking about. But it wasn't easy to find the right people to work on it and make sure we made the effort to find um, 
non like partially like non white artists work on it and going to the death of Instagram and you know finding like people like Desmond like like the all the concept artists to find people that would never had the chance to work on this kind of project otherwise so I think you you are right to push us to find these people and and make the actual effort um, because none of us realized that it was an actual issue I mean we know it's an issue but we really didn't um, make the effort to fix the issue and I think on this project we we did uh, our part like our little part to to make the industry a bit better and of course um, anthology itself makes the industry better because it gives visibility to a lot of artists that are not that are not uh, always working on very big and ambi ambitious projects like that so it's a very nice feeling you know so yeah thank you to everyone yeah, I just want to echo what Dorian said. I think, Niendo, you really kept us in check to make sure that we found really authentic artists. Um, and I think that was one of my biggest kind of takeaways and confidence boost from this. We had artists working across several different continents in so many different time zones. And we were really doing something that that really scared me, I think, at the beginning to to know how to manage such a group of people spread out across the world. But, you know, we made it work, Nyendo, with your inc incredible vision and guidance and um, love for this project. Everybody followed along and um, everybody saw it and it, it just worked beautifully. So I think that was one of my biggest production takeaways. Usually when we do uh, work in the beginning of a project, the end result is vastly different. And it was amazing to see how closely the end results stayed to our original concepts. So it was really cool. And obviously, Nyendo briefed us <laughs> well. You had your vision. So thank you so much. Um, also, what I really enjoyed was that it was female characters, female leads and um, goddesses and bringing feminine healing energy um yeah it's very special and thank you again so much for the opportunity and it's so lovely to see you all again as well thank you I mean you've all said such amazing things and it's stuff that like I wouldn't have known um you know and I think we've all learned so much from this I've learned so much from you and um, so uh, much gratitude to all of you Open your eyes. It is not what we have, but what we do. Let's go. To the big leagues, Jayami! From the ruins of Great Zimbabwe! You are a disgrace to your name, Kilo. I should be out there making them pay! <laughs> Chose this fate. You think that's fast? Watch this. All right, let's play. Ready to meet your ancestors?